Here we are in topic four at page one of our notes. Let's say we take a spring, and here it is normally, but we stretch it out, and x is the amount of stretch we've produced, or had we compressed the spring, x could also be the compression amount. What happens? Well, first, let's actually give a direction to that x, that displacement. We pulled the string to the right, and what happens? A force, a restoring force, is generated in the spring. It's called a restoring force because it pulls back toward the normal or relaxed length. So that restoring force, we know, is equal to negative the spring constant times the displacement. Here, this is the spring constant which is really just the stiffness of the spring. And it is measured in newtons per meter. Something similar happens when we take a pendulum <clears throat> and we hang it down vertically, but we move it to the side from its resting or equilibrium position. This is kind of where it wants to be, just naturally when it's resting. We call that the equilibrium position. And if you pull the pendulum to the side by some small angle theta, now we have tension in the string pulling this way, force of tension. We have gravity pulling down. And the gravity force has two components, one that cancels out the tension if it's at rest like this and one that is tangential to, or radial to, the, uh, the path. So if we imagine like this arc, that blue arrow pointing back toward equilibrium is also a restoring force, just like this spring force. So these cancel out. We can get rid of the hypotenuse because we broke it into the components. And that guy right there, is a net restoring force. The tangential component of gravity pulls the pendulum back to equilibrium. And that's what this bullet says. Both systems feel a restoring force that pulls the system back to the equilibrium position. So if you take that restoring force, whether it's gravity or the spring force, and you allow it to be F net, that is the net force acting, which is equal to negative a constant times displacement, then if that restoring force is the net force, you will have the system oscillating back and forth. We call that simple harmonic motion. It's when the uh, oscillation is characterized by the following property. The acceleration and the net force satisfy two requirements. First, the acceleration is uh, opposite the displacement from equilibrium, and two, the acceleration is uh, proportional, directly proportional to the displacement from equilibrium. And again, the way we satisfy these conditions is by making the net force equal to the restoring force. This on the right side is the restoring force. What makes negative kx restoring? Well, the force, uh, that force, negative kx, is opposite the displacement. So if you move your pendulum to the left, the negative kx force pulls back toward equilibrium in the opposite direction. It restores the system in the other direction back from where it, back to where it started. That's what makes negative kx a restoring force. 
But if you look up here, you're noticing that we talk about acceleration, not force. And that's true. Typically, we don't write this condition using force. Um, more often is to write it using acceleration. And the reason why we can swap out net force for acceleration, well, technically, net force is mass times acceleration. And we could divide by mass, but then fold the uh, mass as a constant. So we can just sort of fold that constant into the other constant and let k stand for both. Next page. If we take a pendulum and we pull it back and plot its displacement as time passes, we could pull it back to the right, which means it's all the way over uh, at a maximum positive displacement. But then it swings down to the middle. That's zero displacement. It swings over to the left. That's negative displacement. And it swings back to the middle and then back to positive maximum displacement. It turns out that the curve is a sine graph, a cosine graph, rather. But um, the general term for sine or cosine, sinusoidal, describes uh, both. Those graphs both are sinusoidal. This is an umbrella term. What's happening to the velocity, or this, uh, yeah, the velocity at various moments of time? Well, when you're all the way out to the right edge, right here, you stop, so the velocity is zero. As you swing back toward the middle, you start going in the negative direction, so the velocities should dip down into the negative y-axis, negative values of velocity. But what happens at the middle? You reach maximum speed. Then you move over to the other edge where you stop, v equals zero. You move back to the middle and you speed up, but this time going to the right, that would be positive velocity. So you reach maximum speed at the middle, and then you move to the edge and you stop. And this is also a sinusoidal graph. What about the acceleration? Well, when you start at the right edge, your net force is restoring you back. So if the force, the net force is this way, so is the acceleration. It's a big positive value. Wait, no, it's pointing to the left. It's a negative value. So we start right here. And then when you make it down to the middle, you have no displacement. Therefore, if x is 0, force is 0 too, and you have no acceleration at the middle. And then you swing out to the other edge, and you're being pulled to the right with a large force. So you have a positive acceleration as well. You swing back to the middle, no displacement, no force, and thus no acceleration. And when you make it back here, you have a, a very large negative acceleration pulling you, restoring you back to equilibrium. So this is a sine graph, too. Si a sinusoidal graph, I should say. Now, there's a trick. If you want to find the instantaneous velocity at a given moment, look to this first graph and draw a tangent line. So for example, imagine you are sledding, and here at the very top of the hill, you are flat, perfectly flat. And as you go down the hill, your sled curves. Here it's really steep. Here it starts to level off. There's your sled. Here it's steep again and then it starts to level off once more. If you imagine that tangent line, um, you, will, you can look at its slope, and in general, slope of this graph is change in uh, position over time, or displacement. That is velocity. The tangent line tells us the slope at this point. It's zero, zero slope. And look down here. Velocity is zero. Look at the uh, tangent line right here. Its slope is zero, and at that moment, velocity is zero. So the tangents can tell us the instantaneous slope. If you look right here, this is where you're going fastest because right, you know, a little bit later you start to curve back up again. Um, this is the steepest line, the biggest slope. 
and look at that it's the largest speed we're farther from you know the farthest from the x-axis where v is zero so okay so what have we learned you can find instantaneous velocity on the first graph using the slope of the tangent line um, so take a moment draw tangent lines at the center position and at each edge and then confirm that they agree with your second graph down below okay what about the velocity graph let's look back up there if we draw if we want to know what slope equals here we do change in y-axis over change in x-axis and change in velocity over change in time the rate at which velocity changes is acceleration so if you draw a tangent line right here, what's the slope of that line? The slope is zero. The acceleration is zero. Is that really true? Look down below. Yes, at that same moment in time, A is zero. Right here, that's a flat tangent line. We're at the top of the hill. Our sled is horizontal. This horizontal line has no slope. It doesn't rise at all. A is zero, the slope is zero. And look down below at that moment, A is zero. That's pretty cool. Uh, A is zero. And again, this is a positive slope because the line goes up. That's the steepest part of the graph. So we expect a big slope, a big acceleration, and it's positive because the line goes up, just as this shows some big positive acceleration right there. So that's pretty cool. It all agrees. Draw those tangent lines. Um, you know, the tangent, we can say slope of tangent line equals acceleration. On to the next page. We're going to take some time to do this practice on pages 1, uh, sorry, numbers one through four, and then five and six on the next page as well. Do all of those. Notice this is different. It's variation of y with x. So you're graphing acceleration with displacement. And don't forget the equation. Acceleration equals negative kx. That's important. What will this graph look like? Um, skip this part because we'll do that together in class. And then the one thing I want to do before we move on to this practice, which is pretty straightforward, as a system executes simple harmonic motion, energy is constantly exchanged between two forms. There's kinetic energy when the object is moving fast and potential energy when the object briefly stops at the edge of its path. So what I want you to think about in the problems or the questions below is what forms of energy are we dealing with? Remember we've learned about electric potential energy, um, there's things like elastic potential energy, gravitational potential energy, so consider those types. Answer one through four on this page and then answer five as well. And from there, we'll move on to this work in class.